<laughs> if you're with us today, thank you for holding. Uh, we did have some technical difficulties today getting this started. I can't explain it. It's live TV. It's live TV. I, I'm sorry. Thanks for sticking around. But uh, if you're still here, probably it's because you have some questions for us. That's good. Uh, we'll be very happy to answer those for you. Our topic today is common defenses in New York, and we're going to try to take an uncommon, sort of fun look at those defenses. And we're going to be talking about both legal defenses and fact defenses to workers' compensation claims in New York. Um, this is part of our workers' compensation defense series. Last month, we did uh, the defense of non-employment. So we talked about independent contractors, and this person just doesn't work here. Uh, next month, we're going to take a look at going and coming because it's such a big defense that it really needs its own webinar. And today, we're going to be talking about just about everything else on that list. No accident, intoxication, notice, statute of limitations, intentional injuries, recreational injuries, the personal risk doctrine, and lunchtime injuries. So we're going to be covering a lot of different defenses. Um, as you know, in New York, if we do nothing and a new case comes in or a new claim comes in or there's an injury at work, it's going to be presumed compensable. Um, in the contraposition to that, let's say there's a case we want to controvert and we want to defend the case. Um, well, we've got to do something. And that thing is file a Freud 4 04 or a Schroy 04, which is a first report of injury denial type or a subsequent report of injury denial type. Uh, there are many different defenses that can be entered into that electronic denial form. Uh, and typically our clients will call us up and say, hey, uh, what defenses should go on here, what, which ones shouldn't go on here, and we'll help them pick out those electronic defenses. Only the carrier or its third-party administrator can file the Freud or Schroy. Uh, so in the case of a self-insured, of course, they can file one for themselves. We, the defense attorneys, cannot file those denial forms in the state of New York. We file all the supplemental forms that go along with the denial. And today in your handout materials, we did include a um, case which was recently decided. In fact, Joe Melchione, who's sitting to my left, your right, was the trial attorney in that case. That case is called Pabon versus Crown Energy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the case and why we think it's such a good case for employers uh, and carriers denying cases in New York right now? Okay, sure. Uh, okay, this case specifically involved uh, an incident where a claimant was injured at work while he was on a lunch break. He left for his, take his lunch break. He was boarding a bus and he fell and he injured his knee. Uh, we denied the claim saying that the claimant was on his lunch break. He was not under the direction of his employer and therefore the claim was not compensable. The claimant argued that he remained under the direction of his employer while he was at lunch. He was paid during his lunch. And the claimant also asserted that our denial documents, our pleadings were insufficient on their face. And as a result, we waived our defenses to the claim. Um, following the trial and the uh, testimony of a lay witness and the claimant himself, the judge determined that the claim was not compensable. The claimant did not remain under the direction of his employer during his lunch and uh, disallowed the claim. Um, the claimant appealed the decision and uh, a large thrust of their appeal was that our denial pleadings were insufficient on their face. Right, so let's, let's just take a little brief moment here and talk about what that means. We filed a pre-hearing conference statement in support of the electronically filed denial notice. Um, and let's be frank, that pre-hearing conference statement, it's two pages. Mm -hmm. It requires us to list all of our documents and all of our witnesses and everything we intend on raising in defense of the case. Sure. There's a lot of boilerplate in there, meaning a lot of we will identify documents, we will identify video, we will identify witnesses. Um, but one line that we put in there, which is we reserve the right to call any witness necessary to rebut the statements of the claimant without actually identifying the rebuttal witness because we can't know who that rebuttal witness might be until right. the claim is testified. Right. 30 days is hardly enough time to, to effectuate a proper investigation to get all of our ducks in the row. So mm -hmm. that's why the, the disposition of this particular case is of great import to all of our future cases mm -hmm. because we pretty much submit a very similar denial pleading in most of our cases. And mm -hmm. if this uh, was found to be insufficient, uh, then this could potentially be a defense to all of our claims. Right. So. And just to be careful, our adversary is really saying to the judge, judge, you should strike all their defenses and not allow them to defend this case because they weren't specific enough in what they put in their pre-hearing conference statement. 
Right. Um, and let's also be frank, oftentimes the judges go for that argument and they will strike defenses Absolutely. based on what they're calling a defective pre-hearing conference statement. They're saying you didn't put enough information in this thing, therefore uh, you're not going to be even really allowed to defend this case very well, mm -hmm. right? Um, and our adversary in this case was slamming their hand on the table going, this is defective, we're going to prevail, blah, 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 blah. Right, right. Which, which means uh, I was more, even more pressure on me to deliver on this case. Right? So <laughs> very happy that the case, the, the case came out in our favor. So Good, good. And so we put this one into the um, handout materials today to say two things. First, you can win on a denial mm -hmm. uh, based on one of the defenses that we're going to talk about today. And the second thing is um, filing the pre-hearing conference statements and doing everything necessary to perfect the denial, the paperwork, the attorney certification, et cetera, that needs to be filed, it's important. Um, and this case, I think, is useful for any carrier or employer out there who's had their defenses stripped because allegedly their pre-hearing conference statement was too vague or uh, was somehow uh, too open to bring in any witness or document. So that's, I think, useful for us in the future. All right, well, I'm going to walk through some of the easy, simple defenses. Do you mind? Because, I mean, this is really your presentation. I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> uh, uh, let's talk about the defense of no accident. This is really the simplest defense, right? We're alleging that there is nothing specific uh, that arose out of in the course of the employment. Um, now, this will often apply to accident cases or claims for occupational injuries, you know, those respiratory claims that we see all the time, the repetitive motion claims. In those cases, we're going to be arguing that, you know, there's nothing specific to or peculiar to this workplace that's causing those injuries. For more discussion and in-depth discussion on defending repetitive occupational, respiratory claims, and occupationally induced hazards and injuries, come to our November uh, webinar because that's the one where we spend the entire hour just talking about just those defenses. But uh, we fold in under the no accident, the no exposure cases, which would be the repetitive occupationals and the noise cases, the hearing loss claims. Um, but you know, defending a no accident case, meaning there was no loss at work, it's usually going to involve some kind of uh, affirmative defense. The claimant can simply say, I was injured, I claim it injured, I happened at work. That's all they need to really show. And then we've got to come in there and meet those presumptions and rebut them specifically. And if I may, Greg, these are very common. We very mm -hmm. commonly see C3 forms that are filed alleging claims where it was unwitnessed. Mm -hmm. and I think that winning these cases comes down to attacking the credibility of the witness. Mm -hmm. Carefully looking over the C3 and the other documents from the medicals to see if the claimant's testimony doesn't kind of jive with what the initial allegations were. Yeah. If we're able to impugn the claimant's credibility, we have a chance of getting these claims won. Yeah, strongly, strongly agree. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, personal attacks or personal cases or idiopathics. I think these are some fun cases. Um, again, absent any sort of evidence to the contrary, a judge of compensation is going to find that an injury that occurred at work arose out of the employment, and sometimes we've got to break that causal link. So I'm going to give you a fact scenario here, okay, and present it in a video, and then I'm going to ask you uh, what you would do to defend this case, okay? Sounds fun. Great. All right, here we go. Hey, I know you are the one who has been sleeping with my wife. Prepare to die. I have no idea what you are talking about. I am not sleeping with your wife. I saw her phone. You have been awling her all the time. Admit you are having an affair. Jerry, don't shoot him. All those phone calls were about work. We are not sleeping together. You are being crazy. Okay. So, in this example, we've got our, our lovely checkout uh, worker in the retail establishment there. Uh, her husband or significant other comes to work and says, I know you've been talking to my wife. I see the text on her phone. And the co-employee says, well, what are you talking about? Uh, and she yells out, don't shoot him. Those phone calls were about work. Uh, we're not together. You're being crazy. Doesn't matter. He still blows him away. All right. Compensable or not compensable? Well, Greg, like as is the case with most of these, uh, it's a very fact-based inquiry. I would argue initially perhaps that because the injury was caused and originated based upon facts that were not work-related, personal specifically to that employee outside of the work context that it's not compensable. But unfortunately, based upon the facts as they've been presented, it happened on the work premises. And if it turns out after an investigation that the text did involve the uh, 
exchange of communication regarding employment, it does bring it within the realm of that comp of, of a compensable injury. Yeah, I agree. I feel like if their only communication was really like talking about their work schedule and stuff that's going on at work, and that sets off this jealous husband, and then he comes to work and kills the guy. Uh, yeah, the guy who was killed definitely has a, com a compensable injury, and certainly his dependents would get that benefit. Sure. Absolutely. Um, all right, walk us through consequential injuries, because that's another type of case where you know we're frequently denying the idea of a consequential injury. Correct. And I think that the reason why we deny consequential injuries so commonly is because of when they tend to appear in the life of a case. Mm -hmm. Cases mm -hmm. established for a left shoulder originally, they've been treating for a year, two years, and then suddenly as the case is approaching permanency, you see a report come in alleging that the claimant now has a right shoulder uh, injury that uh, arose as a consequence to the original injury. And, right. in, and in most cases, you see that these injuries mirror each other. If it's established for a left knee, all of a they'll sudden allege it's a right, it's a right yeah. knee. And the reason that they claim, the claimant claims that is that they say because their left knee is, in, is injured, they have to overcompensate for that injury by using their right knee, and right. now that injury is uh, is part of the claim. It should be part of the claim. Mm -hmm. uh, we deny these uh, because it could indefinitely delay the length and the life of the claim. Right. And what I think it comes down to is the credibility of the medical witnesses. And to, truthfully, I think that we're successful in denying consequential claims more than one may, might think. Mm -hmm. If we bring in the uh, and depose the doctors and the claimant as to prior injuries or mechanism of injury, um, as long as we're able to, again, impugn the credibility of the medical professional or the claimant, there's a possibility that the uh, the injury will not be amended to the claim. Okay. Agreed. Cool. Uh, let's talk about intoxication okay. as a defense. Under section uh, workers' compensation law 21.4, uh, a work injury that is the sole consequence of intoxication will not be found to be compensable. You used a magic word in there. I did use a magic word, and that's why this is primarily an illusory defense, because the word solely uh, indicates that the injury may be found to be compensable if there's any other contributing factor to the claimant's injury outside of the intoxication. For instance, mm -hmm. he downs a few beers, he's operating a machine, he's been working for on a 16-hour shift, and the claimant becomes injured. That claimant then could go into court and say, yeah, you know what, I was injured, but I was also working for 16 hours, and I was tired, so I was tired, also yeah. fatigued. Mm -hmm. Or I fell while intoxicated, yes, but there was water on the floor of the premises, so that caused me to slip. Right. Um, and if that's the case, then the claim will most likely be found to be compensable. All right, let me show you some uh, a video here and tell me what you think. Looks like a guy's having a, a couple pops before work. <laughs> yeah, he's going to work. I feel like I see what's going to happen here. He's lost his finger. We go to the doctor. Your employee's blood alcohol levels were 0.4, which is four times the legal limit for driving. He was intoxicated when he cut himself. All right. Clearly, drinking before work, nothing to do with work. Now comes to work, chops his finger off. What do you think? Again, uh, and I hate to use this as a kind of a catch-all, but it, it's a factual-based uh, analysis. Uh, this guy had a 0.4 blood alcohol level. I would argue that's way beyond the limit. If anyone had a 0.4 blood alcohol level, they wouldn't be able to accomplish the tasks. But knowing what I know about the strong Section 21 presumptions in workers' compensation law, if that claimant is able to prove that a anything involving the work premises or his the tools he was using contributed in any way to his injury, it would be found to be compensable. Yeah, I agree. And this would be a case where I might tactically advise a client, let's deny it, right? Because uh, there might be the value of you, you scare him off, like he, he was intoxicated, he knows it, so maybe he just won't pursue the claim. Uh, or at least you're raising the defense to sort of tee the case up for a Section 32. Absolutely. Often in an intoxication case, too, we'll have situations where the employer wants to terminate this person because now they violated a safe work policy sure. or an or employment policy. And then the other um, issue we see with intoxication defenses is we see marijuana used more and more as a medicine or relax, whatever. Um, and there really aren't good standards for when you're intoxicated under things like marijuana uh, or cannabinoids. And for those reasons, it's much more difficult to defend a case on a theory of intoxication when the drug is illicit. Agreed. And, and along those lines, unless a blood sample or uh, some other means of measuring the level of, of intoxication, uh, directly after a work accident, it's going to be very tough to prove that that the, cl the claimant was of a particular level of intoxication that caused him to have that accident. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of factors. Yeah. All right. 
I'm going to take another easy one, um, notice. So here's an easy uh, situation that in New York there is a notice defense. Uh, the claimant has 30 days to provide written notice to their employer. Um, there is case law that says it could be constructive notice. In other words, if the employer knows that the accident took place, like for example, the employee didn't work the rest of the day and left in an ambulance to go to the hospital, sure. you have constructive notice that there was a loss on your location. However, uh, we often see retaliatory workers' compensation claims filed in the state long after the person has separated from the employment, and then we're defending cases on issues of notice. So, uh, let's give an example. Hey Greg, one of our employees brought in this medical note saying that he was injured at work four months ago. I asked around, and no one who was working that day remembers anyone being injured, and no written report was made by the employee or anyone else. Can they file a worker's compensation claim? All right, so that's a really very, if you ask me, very typical scenario. Mm -hmm. It's been months and months. No one knew about this loss. All of a sudden, he's come to work with a medical note saying, I'm out of work or I was injured on this specific day. Um, I think this one's pretty straightforward. This is a case where I would be advising the client, let's deny it. Let's get into the medicals. This is where we'd have to do investigation mm -hmm. and hopefully come up with an employer witness so that we have someone to come and say, nope, no one was hurt. He never reported. He worked for weeks and weeks and weeks after this alleged loss with no lost time and working his same job. Full, time, full duty, full dot. Fair? I totally agree, and I think this case w would most likely not be successful, would not be found to be a compensable claim. Again, it comes down to credibility. If, he, mm -hmm. if the claimant is unable to produce a witness, yeah. and we are able to produce a witness saying that there was nothing written, the claimant didn't tell anybody, um, we can ask that claimant on cross-examination, well, if you had this accident, why didn't you tell anyone? Why didn't you write it down? Um, this would be a, a prime example of a claim you want to deny right away. Right. Um, Okay, let's just very briefly talk about the statute of limitations. Um, you got two years from the date of loss. I mean, that's about it. Yeah, there. for, for uh, specific injuries, you have two years from the date of loss. For occupational claims, you have two years from the date that you became disabled as a result of the condition, or two years from the time you should have known that your condition was related to your work. Uh, and in my experience, that when you should have known usually is when you went to your attorney who told you, oh, by the way, you're hearing losses because you worked 20 years ago in a tunnel. Absolutely. Fair. Yeah. yeah. This also comes up a lot when you see the two years in a claimant. Have we gotten jaded? No, no. Joe, I think. No, because, well, I wouldn't have said this the first time I presented this, but I'll say this this example now because it's actually come up. You see that the claim is, is about two years old and suddenly the claimant is amending, trying to amend the claim to add another body part because the attorney and the claimant realized that that two-year statute of limitations is coming up and they better file that claim if they want to add that body part. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another example where you want to immediately deny based upon statute of limitations. But again, that's a red herring because then what we see, as we said before, the other bane of our existence is uh, they could just simply allege that the claim is consequential. Right. And then therefore takes it outside the realm of that statute of limitations. Right, <laughs> right. Um, all right, let's talk briefly about intentional um, as a defense. So uh, intentional self-harms are defensible and you should prevail. Uh, we're really talking about very obvious intentionals, um, things where people are literally leaving suicide notes and jumping off bridges at work. Um, you need something that very, very, very obvious. Um, we have raised intentionality as a defense in cases, for example, where a claimant has not worn their protective safety gear. And we've shown that we've worn them many times, wear your gear, wear your gear. Yeah, they're refusing to wear their gear. They're refusing to wear their safety shoes, for example, or their steel tip boots. Um, also where they've been specifically prohibited from doing something. No one should go on this side of the plant. That plant is, side of the plant is undergoing repairs. No one go on that side of the plant. And of course, they're all punching in and going and hiding on that side of the plant because they know there's no foreman or managers are gonna walk through that uh, area of our premises. Well, um, very difficult uh, defense to prevail on, uh, absent a literal suicide note saying I jumped off the bridge because I was uh, angry at, at, at my wife or something. There's really going to be very difficult to show intentionality. It doesn't mean we don't raise the defense. Really to cue the case up or tee the case up for a lump sum dismissal settlement under uh, Section 32. Great. Okay, let's talk about recreational cases and let's just lead right into like a really fun fact pattern. You ready for this one? I'm ready. Okay. Attention staff, the company picnic is tomorrow and I expect all of you to be there and play on our soccer team. My goal is to win the company trophy. Boss, my daughter's recital is tomorrow. I can't make the picnic. The memo said the picnic was optional anyway. Winning is not optional to me. I expect you to play or I will remember it at review time. Okay, remember, I expect us to win. 
All right, and now we've got our our poor employee with blood shooting out of her face. She didn't even want to be there. She wanted to go to her daughter's recital. And the boss says, winning is not optional to me. I demand, essentially, that you be there, right? Winning is mandatory. Um, we know in New York that recreational activities are not compensable, right? Right. Uh, but there are some factors to consider in, in any evaluation for recre recreational injury. First is, was the activity required by the employer? The well, second, no, no, she got a memo saying this is not in, mandatory. In this case, but I think it's, again, it's a, let me go through the, the factors first. Whether the uh, event was mandatory. Second, whether the event was sponsored by the employer. Or three, whether the claimant or the employer was, employee was compensated for their participation. In this situation, although the memo stated that it was not optional, I think that the boss didn't do himself any favors in saying that winning was not optional. So, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, he transformed right, it into any, mandatory. Any reasonably objectable, objective mind would think that the employee had no choice but to join or they would suffer some sort of negative uh, employment response. So yeah, therefore, agreed. in this case, I think yeah. it wasn't very voluntary and agreed. therefore we're stuck. So, <laughs> agreed, agreed. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see the last one because this is my favorite. Sure. This is my favorite case. Uh, it's not even from this state, but who cares? Uh, let's talk about lunch break injuries. Generally speaking, injuries that occur at lunch are not compensable, uh, particularly unpaid break injuries, typically not compensable. Uh, the courts will look at how closely related the break is to the employment. There are cases that say uh, simply punching out, walking across the street to get a uh, uh, Twinkie and then walking back may be compensable, but let's not get into that sort of gray areas. Uh, generally speaking, on-premises lunch break injuries are going to be compensable as well. Um, but in general, a lunch break injury, we should be denying those. Uh, put them to their proofs and take a look at really uh, how the employer is benefiting from that person's break. Uh, there's a really fun set of facts in a workers' compensation case in New Jersey that occurs at lunch uh, and really kind of ties up this entire presentation. It could, it could occur in New York. Yeah. So here we have our lovely Judy Coleman. And every day she had lunch in the employee break room and she loved to do her hair. Now, this is a case from the 80s. So there's a lot of hairspray <laughs> going on. It's also a case from the 80s because the other thing she liked to do is smoke cigarettes in the break room. So she's in there spraying her hair with hairspray and smoking cigarettes and literally lights her hair on fire. Uh, her employees beat her quite severely, uh, putting the flames out. Uh, they're batting her about the head and neck, trying to put out the flames. And she is quite injured, very significantly injured. In fact, this case went all the way up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Uh, and I think it's probably the most fun set of facts there could possibly be. And more, there couldn't be more 80s than this case. Uh, <laughs> ultimately, this was found not to be compensable. And I think our New York uh, Court of Appeals would agree. Um, she was, yeah, she was on a break. She was unpaid. She was on premises, which would typically would be the thing that would bring it within the workers' compensation law. But she was doing things that were clearly not to the benefit of the employer. Correct. Things that were clearly unanticipated or uh, dangerous. I mean, smoking cigarettes and blasting hairspray and at the same time, Absolutely. dangerous moves, even if she did that every day. And so they found that the case was not compensable, even though it did occur at lunch. Um, Practical strategy in defending these types of cases and looking at all these types of fact patterns that we looked at today. Well, I think, uh, as we alluded to before, we have a very short, small, brief window for which to get our facts together. We have to deny the claim within weeks of the injury. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get our case together. So uh, in order to do that, we want to contact the employer, contact the insured, and get as much information from them as possible. We want to get an investigative report if one is issued. We want to certainly remember to ask if an investigative report was issued. We want to uh, get the names, identities, and contact information for all the witnesses. So mm -hmm. we can get right on that, contact them, and find out what they know. And we want to get a hold of all the medical evidence. Sometimes the claimant doesn't submit the full breadth of the medical uh, evidence that they have. And if they don't submit it to the board's file, we may not have that. So we want to ask our are insured if they have that so that we can have a, as broad of a perspective on this case as early as possible mm -hmm. so we know what information we need to get and what our witnesses are going to say before trial. Agreed. All right. Uh, with that, uh, we ran long. We started late. We had some technical difficulties. Are there some questions? Let me take a look over here. Um, if you haven't typed your question in now, now would be the time to do it. I'm popping over. I don't see any questions. Now, we've had um, some technical difficulties today, so I'm not 100% confident that this GoToWebinar situation is working perfectly today. I think they might be having issues on their end. Um, if, we, if you did have a question and I just can't see it, uh, please feel free to email it to us, and we'll get to it um, 
afterwards in an email. Uh, we do see the notes and comments saying, hey, why is there no webinar today? Uh, there was one. Sorry, it started late. Again, we had a few technical challenges here today. All right, next month's topic, we're going to be talking about the going and coming defense. Uh, this has been Greg Lois, and to my left, your right, Joseph Melchione. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, Thanks. everybody.